Don't ball a tough ball on me. Okay? <laughs> uh, that's a pretty impressive CV you've got there. Um, <laughs> so you're a lover of cricket? I'm a lover of life. Nobody in India ever forgets uh, what happened here in 1983. It's Kapil Dev's captaincy. Well, it's not a game, it's a religion. <laughs> we don't get enough sun in London. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason why you guys went all over the world. <laughs> you should have a chat with the, the groundsman here at Lord. Let's talk about your motorcycle ride. Now you're coming to life. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking forward to it? <laughs> when I sit on the motorcycle, I'll be just looking straight forward. <laughs> Are you pushing this challenge a bit too far? <laughs> Yoga meditation. Do you recommend I do it? Oh, you must do it. That is the most frightening thing. Particularly to retired cricketers, I'm very <laughs> compassionate. <laughs> Good day, everyone, and welcome to Lord's Cricket Ground in London. Uh, I'm Angus Fraser, the former Middlesex and England cricketer. Uh, I played cricket for England in the 1990s, and for those of you that follow cricket, uh, I was the bowler at the boat at Sachin Tendulkar uh, when he pushed me for three through extra cover uh, to score his first international hundred. That was at Manchester in 1990. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, so I suppose that's so one of my. He that hundred out of you. He, he did, yes. Uh, today, I've given the pleasure and the honour of asking Sadhguru who along with being a yogi, mystic and visionary, is an environmentalist and one of the most influential people in our times. So, pleased to meet you. Good morning to you, Angus. How are you? Don't, don't ball a tough ball on me, okay? <laughs> I won't. How are you? <laughs> Very well, thank you. Uh, that's a pretty impressive CV you've got there. Um, <laughs> um, I, was... I don't read those things, so I'm okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, welcome to Lord's Cricket Ground and welcome to London. Um, and thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, have you been to Lord's before? No, it's really nice to be here. We heard so much about this. I would like a fairway like this. <laughs> <laughs> you've been playing a bit of golf then, whilst in London. Um, what do you think of it? Uh, we'll hopefully show you around the pavilion in a little while too, to sort of get a taste of the history of the place. Well, um, yeah, in terms of uh, history and what's happened here, and in many ways, the evolution of the cricket game is around these places. In that sense, it's important. Well, the modern uh, stadiums are much, much bigger and many things happening, but well, the significance is uh, the past. <laughs> I hope it may inspires uh, the game in the future because I hear that the English fans have all shifted to football. <laughs> There's a movement there. There's still a, a core of cricket fans, but yeah, football is, is the number one sport over here. But uh, cricket is obviously, I mean, huge in India, uh, that's for sure. I noticed you were in Tiga last week um, mm -hmm. uh, with two great cricketing legends. Oh, yes. Viv <laughs> Richards and uh, Ian Botham. Uh, did you enjoy that company? Very much. It's always, uh, you know, like uh, some time ago uh, when I was having a conversation with Chris Gale in India, so he asked me, Sadhguru, who is your uh, greatest cricketer? I said, Vivian Richards, of course. He said, how can you say that? I thought you will say Chris Gale. I said, you are not a cricketer, you are like a gladiator, you are a warrior, <laughs> you go like, <laughs> you know. So Vivian Richards was one of your heroes then? Well, always. Uh, I, I thought... Uh, there was a kind of a special touch to his game, which has been rarely seen. So you're a lover of cricket? I'm a lover of life. Cricket is coming as a part of it. I don't get uh, much... I mean, I don't get time in the last 25, 30 years to much watch much cricket. Uh, this Antigua match that I went to, where the English and the West Indies were playing, I'm sitting in a test match after 48 years, and with Viv Richards and Iron Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and did they give you any tips? Huh? Did they give you any tips? No tips. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've to say, obviously been aware of cricket. What would you say, okay, just sticking on the cricket theme for a little while, your sort of greatest memories of watching India, India play cricket? Well, everybody, nobody in India ever forgets uh, what happened here in 1983. How can we forget that? I played golf with Kapil. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, that moment was uh, one of the biggest turning points for India's uh, cricket. I think since then, uh, India has been playing a completely different kind of game. I think uh, it's Kapil Dev's captaincy which kind of 
a docile Indian cricket team to a more aggressive, wanting to win kind of thing. Otherwise, uh, we played and we are happy we played well and that's, that's the kind of attitude they had. It's only after 1983, I think, uh, India wants to win. And since then, many great captains have come, like uh, Saurav Ganguly took it to another level of aggression <laughs> and uh, MS Dhoni, of course, brought a totally different kind of game and of course, uh, our Virat Kohli, again, a very aggressive winning kind of captains. These things have happened only after 1983. Before that, we were a very docile, just wanting to be there kind of team. Well, I always remember actually one of the... I, I retired in 20, 2002 and was a journalist for seven years uh, with the independent newspaper. And one of the greatest games of cricket I ever witnessed was uh, the One Day International that took place here when India chased down over 300 runs. Uh, I think you've read Singh and Mohammed Kaif. Uh, got runs in that game, oh, and Sarah no. Ganguly took his shirt off on the balcony <laughs> and waved it around. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what sort of role does cricket play in... I mean, I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to spend quite a bit of time in India, but what sort of role does cricket play in the lives of people in India? We hear uh, lots of stories about the, the um, fanatical support. Well, it's not a game, it's a religion. <laughs> <laughs> so, it fires the people <laughs> into extreme emotions in many ways. And uh, probably for a variety of, you know, for the poorer class in the country, there are many difficulties in villages and uh, small towns, economic struggles and daily hardships. I think cricket is one of the biggest reliefs that they find once they sit in the cricket ground or they watch it on the television, millions of people. I think everything is forgotten. I see p young people, old people, all, you know, like old ladies over 80, 85 years of age, sitting and glued to the televisions and watching and screaming <laughs> like children. <laughs> it's fantastic that way. Really brings the country together, you get the feeling. Definitely does. Apart from that, uh, country coming together is one thing. But what is more important is people who have never played a game in their lives, they don't know what it means to be on a sporting field. In some way, without physically being there, they go through the joys and pains of that game in a beautiful way. <laughs> and just briefly on London, how long have you been in London? I mean, thank you for coming to Lords as you've... Uh, as part of your trip to London, and we'll talk about uh, what's starting <laughs> next week. Uh, but um, how long have you been in London? Now I've been here for three, three, four days now. So uh, it's been good, lots of meetings and... Uh, Who have you been meeting? Uh, mainly meeting lawmakers, a few journalists and uh, various uh, group of influencers. The idea is uh, these hundred days we want to change the narrative on the planet towards soil. We want three to four billion people to talk about soil. So... Uh, in that con uh, context, we are moving that. And another aspect is, we are looking for a friendly policy towards soil in all the nations. So through Commonwealth, through United Nations agencies, where we have partnerships with them, we are seeing how to bring about soil-friendly uh, policies in every nation, because that time has come. If we don't do this now, uh, we will be a generation of deep regret so, uh, we are trying to move in that direction. Yes, yeah, so, so, so moving on to I say, the, the, the real thrust of the reason why you're here and the, the Safe Soil campaign uh, that uh, you've started and you're hoping to, well, and definitely will sort of promote uh, with this cycle ride that we'll talk about in a little while. Um, can you explain what you mean by saving soil and, and why do we need to enrich it for those of us? Myself, I just thought soil was soil. Uh, but having read about uh, what you're, try you're doing in the last couple of days, you realize there's far much more to it than that. See, unfortunately, uh, in today's world, unfortunately, people are thinking soil is some inert material, that you can add some chemicals to it and make food grow out of that. First of all, uh, for the younger generation, uh, because many of them think food grows uh, in the supermarket, or food uh, comes through Amazon <laughs> or some other, you know, app yep. through which they get their food. No food grows only in soil. 
everything that you know as life only has come out of soil. Whether it's a worm, insect, bird, animal, tree, man, woman, every one of us have only come out from the soil. We must get this now that we are a consequence of what's happening in the soil. We as a life is a consequence of the complex activity that's happening in the soil. It's a living soil. So the idea that it's a living soil itself is not there in most people's minds. So bringing this context to people's lives and also bringing this to the administrations and policy makers is very important because I have been in uh, interactions with various agricultural departments, ministries around the world. Most nations are treating soil as inert substance, that they can add this and that and make it work. That's not how it is. Today, people know that uh, your very body is sixty percent microbial activity. Only forty percent is your uh, parental genetics. Really? Was, yes. Your sixty percent is microbes. <laughs> Don't know what to make of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the same is true with the soil. What is happening in the soil is what's happening in our body. And we know today without the gut microbiome, you can't even digest the food that you eat. You cannot get the nutrients that you need. The same is true in the soil. The plants cannot... the plant life cannot get the nourishment that they need without exchanging carbon sugars with the microbes, otherwise they won't give. It's a marketplace, a very sophisticated marketplace. So, keeping it alive is a fundamental responsibility towards future generations because unless the soil organic content is a minimum of three to six percent, the life will not happen there. To what extent means if you take a handful of soil, there is nearly ten billion organisms in one handful of soil. That is the level of aliveness that is there. But that is going down significantly. Significantly means according to UNFAO, uh, twenty-seven thousand species of organisms are going extinct per year. I'll repeat that because most people won't understand this. Twenty-seven thousand species, not organisms, are going extinct every year. At, at this rate, in another thirty to forty years, we will reach a place where we cannot regenerate the soil. If you want to regenerate the soil at that time, it will take hundred and fifty to two hundred years. You know what kind of disaster that is. But today, if we attempt it, in the next ten to fifteen years, twenty years, we can definitely make a significant turnaround. That's why this time is very important. Well, that's frightening. I mean, this ground holds 30,000 people, so um, <laughs> 27,000 uh, would, 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 would fill this ground. How do we enrich soil then? Hmm? How do we enrich soil naturally? See, if you take sand and add organic content to it, it becomes soil over a period of time. If you take soil and take all the organic content out, it'll become sand. This is called as a desertification process, which is the biggest problem right now in the world. The world is slowly turning into a dry desert because organic content is missing in the agricultural soil. What happened? A farm means naturally there was trees and animals and stuff. Now we've all gone into monoculture, our farms are shaved clean, nothing, only machines. There are no animals, there are no plants. See, people may think there are many technologies. Yes, there are many technologies to enhance application, but Organic content comes only from the green litter, from the trees and vege other vegetative matter and the animal waste. There is simply no other way. There is just simply no other way. This is something that everybody must understand. We are trying to grow food without any animals, without any vegetative matter. After twenty-five years of farming on a land, it's finished. It's turning into a desert. And it was the sort of you noticing that, I mean, there were the predictions, wasn't there, that was it sixty percent of Tamil Nadu uh, would become That was desert. in ninety-eight. Somebody made a prediction. Then I went around to check it and I found it could happen much sooner than what they predicted. And it is true. And and, and that sort of slightly kick-started your, your interest yes. and, and, and study of that. I mean, how... We've got, I'll touch on that in a little while, but I mean, ha the sort of effects that soil degradation has on people's lives, um, could one you, thing could is, you tell me what, how, one, that, how that affects people? One thing is nourishment levels. It has been found most vegetables uh, have uh, very degraded levels of nourishment today compared to what it was a century ago. 
a century ago, that is in early 20th century, if you ate a certain vegetable, how much nourishment it gave you. Today, most of the vegetables have only 10% of that. If you ate in 1920, if you ate one orange, what you got out of it? Today, you have to eat eight oranges to get the same. So this is why everybody's popping pills all the time. And uh, pharmacies which sell uh, vitamins and uh, other kinds of supplements, they are growing like anything as if they are food shops. Some of the pharmacies in the United States is as big as uh, food malls, you know, massive. Because everybody is buying heaps of uh, supplements, otherwise the food is not enough. But what you get from a supplement and what you get from food are two different things. It's not the same. The quality of it is not the same, absorption levels are not the same, and the consequence is not the same. Well, that's, I mean, it's quite a frightening sort of, are you sort of saying that we're getting a small percentage of the nutrients that we use to get out of food, that means we need to eat more, which means we're putting yes, more people, demand on the... the tendency to eat more is only because there is not enough nutrients in it. Body demands more food because it's not enough. So again, we're sort of almost in this cycle where we're hastening the, the sort of degradation of the soils because we're expecting more of them uh, to feed. See, one so, thing is loss of nourishment. Another thing is every responsible scientist in the world is pointing out that by 2045, we will be producing 40% less food than what we are producing right now. And our populations will be well over 9 billion. That's not a world you want to live in. No. That's not a world where you want to leave your children and go, for sure. But that's what we are creating. So it is no more some faraway reality, it is in our lives. 2045 is not too far away. Uh, World Food Program, the UN World Food Program clearly saying that by 2035, there could be dozens of civil wars around the world due to food shortages. Already in the last 50 years, there have been 30 wars in Africa. In these 30 wars, 27 wars were fought to acquire fertile lands because desertification is serious. In the last 35 to 40 years, the, the, the desert has moved or occupied at least 10% more land in Africa than what it was 40 years ago. 10% more desert. If you, you can just see it in the Google map, if you see, from both sides, north-south desert is encroaching into the central part, which is green. A lot of this sort of, um, I said, looking at my research, goes back to your sort of Project Green Hands, doesn't it? And, uh, and the work you did there in the introduction of agroforestry. Uh, and the fact that encouraging farmers to to change the way that they, or the crops that they produce away from the fields that sort of add mechanical machines back to a, a sort of more plant fruit based, I say tree fruit based um, way of farming. See, the important thing is this, on an agricultural field, trying to get uh, organic material from elsewhere, and transporting it and bringing it, it'll never be enough for the field. So this is why we encourage farmers to convert 10% of their land into trees and animals, so that it will fertilize the remaining 90%. That 90% today is producing far more than the whole 100% was producing. So uh, you use the word agroforestry, we started with that actually, but now we change the terminology because uh, if you use the word agroforestry, you will come under the forest ministry, which is full of restrictions. Right. So we change the term to <laughs> tree-based agriculture. Right here. So now we are under the agricultural ministry, so there are many things to do. So we have worked hard to make uh, many policy changes, because without policy change, we could not facilitate this. It took years to make that happen. So with the necessary policy changes happen, now there are subsidies for tree growing, that a farmer gets growth-related subsidy over four years. Uh, all he has to do is take a picture of the tree that is growing and post it on the, their government website. Within a few hours, money will drop into his bank account. I mean, I suppose that's one way of changing the attitudes of farmers by rewarding them financially, so but… Without, uh, without remuneration, it will not work. But so, I mean, it, was, it must have been difficult. I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, when I go to a farmer, never once will I ever speak about ecology 
environment, saving the world, no, that's not his business. We're only talking about how to enhance his economics, that's all it is about. But it can be done in such a way, you can hugely enhance his income, at the same time do wonders for his soil. Whoever, whoever taught you that you can destroy the soil and do good farming, profitable farming, where did this idea come from? <laughs> So, I mean, but changing the views of the farmers must have been a, a real challenge because they'd have been farming in a certain way for hundreds of years or dozens of years. Uh, dozens of years, I wouldn't say hundreds because earlier they were doing it the right yeah. way. Changing the views of the farmers is, uh, is not going to happen by preaching, teaching, lecturing, no. It will only happen by setting up uh, economic demonstration of how it will benefit. So this is what we did in various regions. We set up a few farmers who, whose land changes drastically because of the way they farm. When others see he's making more money, everybody wants to change. All that they need is a little hand-holding to change. But uh, in the interim period of first two to three years where there could be certain loss of income, if the government pitches in and gives a little bit, little bit of subsidies, which is graduated or calibrated for that period, then very easily we can do it. That's what has happened in some of the states in uh, India. Other states are still going slow, but they have done because the budgets needed for this are not large by the government. As the government budgets go, it is not large at all with very minimal thing. The basic thing is ignorance and lack of commitment. It is not really a money issue. Is it a healthier diet for the, for the people that live um, in these areas, the fact that they are potentially eating fruit rather than the wheats and rice? No, no, the trees are not always fruit-bearing trees. See, today, uh, those who have converted, let's say, 15 to 20 percent of their land into trees, but they're still growing the other crops. On the digital market, they can sell their tree in the third or fourth year. Every year, as they take pictures of the growth, they right. get paid for that. The tree will be cut after fifteen years. Right. But already they're being paid for the growth of the tree. But when they cut it, they will get that money. Approximately, we can say this, every twelve years, they will get that much money, which they would only get if they sell the land. So every twelve years, they sell the land and keep the land. And the safe soil, um uh, initiative that you do, I mean, that is strongly based again about putting trees in these… No, no, in no, the, in these... that is not the only thing. See, we have made soil documents now for every country, depending upon the latitudinal position, the soil types, we have identified fourteen types of soil and the economic conditions of a given nation and agricultural traditions. Why I am particularly mentioning agricultural traditions is even if you have all the signs that you want, you cannot change agricultural traditions overnight. You have to respect that and work with that. So for every nation, we have made a separate policy document, which we will be presenting to your government also here. And also, we are addressing the COP15 in Ivory Coast in the month of May, where 170 nations have their representatives. There, we will present it to all of them. And uh, UN agencies, UNCCD is very much with this process. So we are quite confident it will move in that direction. Well, different nations may move at different pace, depending on the severity of the problem that they are facing right now, or the level of awareness, or the commitment of the leadership for such causes. And we are also writing to over 730 political parties in the world, because we want every political party, whether they're right, left or center, to make soil and ecology part of their political manifestos. And success, what does success look like? Or what would you like to think that success looks like if, if, if this all, everything that you're See, looking to you're, do happened? when you're marshalling a very large, uh, let's say, a ship, you don't just go like this and make a U-turn, it'll capsize. If you make a one degree change and hold, it will make a U-turn after some time. So that's all we are asking for. All we are asking for from every nation is, just commit that if you own agriculture land, you must strive towards keeping the 
soil organic content at least minimum three to six percent. So if right now, what is the percentage? In Northern Europe, it is around two percentage, which is very bad for a temperate land. In Southern Europe, it is around one, one point two percent. Sixty-two percent of India's land is below point five percent. That's a disaster. In United States, at least thirty percent of the land has completely lost its topsoil. This is where we are. So, if you give incentives that today we can check your soil organic content, if you get it to four percent, we will give you a certain amount of incentive. But that incentive is only an encouragement because the moment it becomes four to six percent, you will see the input cost of the agriculture will start going down. You need to use less fertilizer, less everything. So input cost going down is a profit for the farmer. Profit for the farmer is most important. As uh, everybody must have heard of this, in India in the last twenty years, around three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide. People think this is only in India. This is not true. In United States, the highest amount of suicides among any profession is among the farming community. And in the last twelve years, fifty percent of the U.S. farmers have not seen a single dollar of profit. I mean, you mentioned that the sort of thirty was it thirty fifty percent of the topsoil in America has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Where did, where does that go? Um, See, is it flushed away are, in rivers and things? These are prairies. These are grasslands. If you plow large tracts of land, today machines are plowing anywhere between uh, twelve to fourteen inches deep. It's in the first fifteen inches that most of the life exists. If you plow it like this and open to sun, life is gone out of it. Topsoil is topsoil only because of its aliveness. Right. But aliveness is gone. And there are strong winds. You've heard of the dust bowl in 1930s. You know, I was in New York City and they were saying, yes, Sadhguru, uh, some millions of tons of uh, soil or dust settled in New York City. And that's a big news. I said, uh, see, you're only talking about the dust or the soil that settled in New York City because the building stopped it, all right? But have you ever thought how many millions of tons of soil has gone into Atlantic Ocean? Well, well yes, and the rivers and, and being blown away. No, I'm saying if New York City stopped millions of tons because of its buildings, right, yes. what was not stopped? <laughs> yes. All went into Atlantic. You can't even measure what it is. Nobody can. But the dust bowls rose in such a way at that time. Now they've controlled it a little bit, but the loss has happened. We can bring it back. The simple thing is there must be some kind of vegetation. It's not only trees. See, right now in UK, about two months ago, uh, we've been pushing this in, in the international fora. Two months ago, they made a law that there will be some kind of remuneration for the farmers for cover crops during summer or winter, whenever a particular land needs it. When the land is not in use, you must keep it covered with some crop, which will enhance the land's capability to produce. Instead of that, we are plowing it and leaving it open to the sun. That is death for the microbial life. And what sort of reaction are you getting from the, the politicians, the governments that you're speaking to as you travel around the world uh, raising this <laughs> issue? See, in the last two years, I've been speaking to so many people, politicians, leaders, influencers, scientists, I have not found one person who says this is not needed. And what I'm seeing is everybody knows what's the problem, at least people who are in responsible positions. They all know what's the problem. Generally, they also know what is the direction of the solution. They may not know the details of the solution, but they know the direction of the solution. When I look at this, what I see is everybody knows what's the problem, everybody knows what's the solution. I think they were just waiting for an idiot to come and bell the cat. Here I am. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be a bit kinder than that. <laughs> I mean, just looking back at some of the other initiatives you've, you've had, um, Rally for Rivers and uh, uh, Calvary Calling, um, water and the importance of rivers is, seems a very important part of... Uh, Sort of directing your interests and and uh, and, and and passions, uh, is it sort of watching the effects of uh, 
I suppose what a See, lot of life is around rivers, isn't it? And, and therefore, it's it's starkest, I suppose. See, this is the issue right now. This keyhole vision of everything, people think air, water, soil, this, that, these are all different things. These are not different things. The very atmosphere you're living in is because of the soil, in the sense, scientists say some million years ago or maybe a billion years ago, when there was no photosynthesis on this planet, the oxygen content in this atmosphere was just a shade over one percent. That means you and me cannot be on this planet. Most of the complex life forms you see here could not be. All those lives which breathe with proper lungs, they could not be here. But today, your oxygen content is around twenty-one percent. That's why we are here. How did this happen? It's the fantastic miracle of photosynthesis, which means using the perpetual uh, energy of the sun. I know you don't have perpetual sun out here. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look behind us here at that machine on the ground there, uh, that's because we don't get enough sun in London. <laughs> and that, they've got lamps there that sort of hopefully make the grass grow a bit better. <laughs> Uh, that's the reason why you guys went all over the world, <laughs> looking for the sun. <laughs> well, it's quite fresh out here, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, using the perpetual energy from the sun, the plant material started manufacturing food, which is carbon sugars. And today, there are a lot of online warriors, online scientists. If you utter the word carbon, they think it's poison. They need to understand we are all carbon life. You, me, a blade of grass, the tree, the animal, everything is carbon life. So what you're calling as life is a certain chain, carbon chain or carbon cycle which is going on. So in this cycle, the most important entity is soil. That, in, uh, that chain link is becoming very thin and weak. If it breaks, the whole chain could collapse. So, the whole movement is to strengthen that because without the soil being strong, life process in the carbon cycle cannot continue. So, the interest is not about water, soil, this, that, it's about life. If life has to be well, soil has to be rich, water has to be clean, air has to be pure, these things will not happen separately. They're all one happening. For example, See, living in temperate uh, climates, most of the water that you get here in the rivers may be melting ice, not entirely, but to a large extent it could be. But in tropical lands, there is no melting ice anywhere. So where is the water coming from to the rivers? For example, in India, our monsoons last somewhere between seventy to ninety, ninety-five days in the year. These ninety-five days of water that was that came down in the form of rain, has to flow for 365 days. So where is it stored? It is a soil. If the soil is organically rich, it has an immense capacity to hold water. The soil can hold eight times more, that means 800 percent more water than all the rivers on the planet. That is the capacity of the soil. But right now, as it becomes more and more barren, less and less organic content, its ability to hold water is gone, so flooding is happening. If you go into a tropical forest or a rainforest and see, you will see water will be in tiny particles, it will be dripping from the root systems and various places. These tiny particles become small rivulets, these rivulets become streams, streams become rivers. By the time you come to the plains, when you see, you can't believe this came from those tiny drops, such a huge river is going on. But if it has to flow, 365 days organic content has to be very rich. For example, in agricultural soil, if you raise the organic cont content to 8 to 10 percent, your irrigation requirement would come down to 30 percent of what you're doing, even in your Lord Cricket field, I'm saying. If you really raise the organic content of this, the irrigation requirement would come down dramatically. If you raise it to 12 to 15 percent, your irrigation requirement would come down to ten to fifteen percent of what you need right now. So, water is held in the soil. Without soil, there'll be no water. What is it that's happened in the desert? It rains, but where is the water? 
It's all gone because it doesn't hold. It, it sounds like you should have a chat with the, the groundsman here at Lords <laughs> after you finish with me. But it, it is fascinating. He thinks just... I'm, he, he will think I'm having a conspiracy, conspiracy <laughs> to beat, beat the English team. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it is fascinating because, I mean, working closely with, um, with the groundsman here, Carl McDermott, and um, how when there's, they put a lot of tap water or sort of from the, from the mains water on the ground, and it's nowhere near as good as the rain that comes out of the sky. So when it when it when it is raining, there, there is so much more, as you said, nutrients and minerals within that water. Are they putting tap water? Uh, well, it it should be from the mains, yes. So when they're Chlor the spring, chlorinated the spring, water, yeah, from the sprinkler system, chlorinated water. Well, they have got some um, wells here. They've got a well here, so okay, they may that well is be getting better. It. Chlorinated water is not good. It's not, and and during the summer. Um, and it's it, it's very noticeable is the fact that uh, whenever they can, they leave the covers off, even though they've got to sort of balance the fact that we've got to play cricket in a couple of days. Uh, but it's just because the the water that comes mm. from the sky provides so many more better nutrients and is better for the the grass. The pitch than, is totally green. It is. Well, we're due, we're not due to start for another three weeks. Middlesex, my county, we're playing here uh, on the seventh of uh, April. But you'll mm -hmm. be, I don't know where you'll be there, but you'll be somewhere else <laughs> um, in Europe. Uh, but at the moment it looks green. At the end of the summer, it looks uh, pretty tired and barren uh, mm -hmm. out there after all the cricket that's been played on it. They haven't yet rolled the place, is it? They will be. They've started the rolling, um, but uh, and that'll increase over over the next over the next few years. I mean, you said earlier that the the situation is retrievable. Um, yes. Uh, in what period? I mean, obviously, action is as you're as, as you're uh, sort of pushing for is needed now but um what period of time how long is it going to take to sort of get us back to some sort of situation that is healthy say so if uh, if we go in a very docile way when i say docile way the simplest thing is to put cover crops on all lands in tropical lands in summers in dry temperate lands just before the winter if you put cover crops in 6 to 8 years time you could have three to four percent organic content. But if you want to go aggressively, then in eighteen months' time, you can have three to six percent uh, organic content. And in sort it's of, just a question of how much money you're willing to spend on it. And in sort of barren desert areas, um, where. See, right now, Saudi Arabia is converting proper desert into very rich agricultural lands. But that will cost millions and maybe billions and billions of dollars, okay? They have the money to do it and they know for the future they must do it. They are doing a massive job of converting desert where they can produce vegetables and fruits and things like this. It's working very well, but that's an immense cost. That's not a cost that most nations will be able to bear. But I'm saying even that can be done. But what people do not know is, around eight to ten thousand years ago, Saudi Arabia was a rainforest. Really? Yes. You... Well, that's talk about your motorcycle ride, um, starting on Monday at Trafalgar Square. Now you're coming to life <laughs> 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 um, Why motorcycle? Um, you have a love for motorcycles? It's not like that. That's what people keep on interpreting because I think they all do things that they like to do. I've made my life in such a way, whatever I do, I make sure I like it. So why a motorcycle? Well, early on, at one point in my life, for almost f four to five years, I literally lived on a motorcycle. I crisscrossed India on a motorcycle. But after that, for thirty-two years, I had not sat on a motorcycle. I never thought of one too. But when I was doing the Rally for Rivers, when I got to Bangalore, in that region, people knew about my motorcycling because people were fascinated for the riding that I was doing, one end of the country to another at that time. They said, Sadhguru, you're not riding, why don't you ride? And they brought one motorcycle. I was wondering after thirty-two years, uh, can I really ride? <laughs> I sat on the motorcycle and then I saw I had not lost a day. Since then, I've been traveling only on a motorcycle last four years. <laughs> yes, even long distances I'm doing on a motorcycle. That can happen to you with cricket.
No, no, I'd, I'd have to <laughs> lose a bit of weight before. I think that age has gone past me there. <laughs> you can get a new, better bike, but not a new, better body, unfortunately. Well, that's my theory, I'm sure. Um, have you got a good bike? I mean, you're doing 100 days um, is, is a cycle ride, going to 24 countries around Europe and then, and then across the subcontinent back to India, uh, and 30,000 miles. So it's an enormous commitment. Um, have you got a good bike? Is it all going to be on the same bike? Uh, it is good. Just now, the company has announced that their main strut that holds the chassis together, there is some problem and there's a recall. In the next one week, they're allowing a, a replacement. But I'm already on the road. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hope it holds up. <laughs> and uh, spares are not available, whatever. But it is a very good bike. No problem about that. I'm sure it'll hold up. I mean... You're looking very healthy and well, uh, but it's physically going to be very demanding. Um, have you been doing some training? No training where I'm just busy in continuously sitting in meetings endlessly. I'm not even getting to walk or exercise a bit. So, probably this is a kind of an advertisement for a yogic back and a yogic head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you leave London on Monday, and how, how many... Well, obviously, how many miles are you looking to do a day? I mean, it says 300 oh, miles a day if you're doing 30. No, because many days we are in the same city with lots of meetings. Yeah. So, on an average, uh, we may be doing somewhere around 440 to 450 kilometers, if you take it as an average. But there are days where I'm doing over 800 kilometers. That's, that's going to be challenging, isn't it? Yes, it is. Are you looking forward to it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when I sit on the motorcycle, I'll be just looking straight forward, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> a lot of time for contemplation. Not really. That's what… that's something I… It's, it's hard for me to explain this. It looks like I'm countering everything that people say. But uh, people ask me, Sadhguru, what are you thinking when you're riding? I said, why will I think? I just ride. There were some beautiful places that you drive through, weren't there? There's a bit… there's some… Miserable yeah. places as well, and there'll be some good weather and bad weather. So, are you well prepared for all different sort of circumstances? Uh, weather, well, I'm in Northern Europe where it's, some parts it's still snowing. Icy roads are uh, not good for two wheels, you know. Mm, well, be <laughs> careful. Yes. So, there's sub-zero temperatures, and now there is a war in the region. So when I hit uh, Arabian deserts, uh, it's around 38 to 40 degrees. Then I'm entering India at the peak of Indian monsoon. So I'm getting the whole works. <laughs> <laughs> I know we all want to challenge yourself, but are you pushing this challenge a bit too far? This is not to challenge myself. I'm not in that uh, state of mind or in that stage of life where I have to prove anything. I thought before I'm too old and no good for anything, this one thing must happen because if this doesn't happen, we will become a generation of deep regret in another twenty, twenty-five years. I don't want to be that. I want to make sure what we can do, we must do. What we cannot do, we cannot do anyway. But what we can do, we must do. If we do not do what we can do, we are a disastrous life. So, this is an effort to inspire the world. This is not a protest. This is not against anybody. This is not against fertilizer company. This is not against a pesticide company, this is not against oil company, this is not against any, anybody. Because wh I'm particularly saying this, because if you say anything environmental, okay, whom shall we punch in the face? We are all culprits in this, every one of us. As a generation, we have used things, all right? As a generation, we can also fix it. So this is a generational responsibility. This is not about fighting with somebody, we want everybody who's participated, all of us have consumed. Now all of us can do the necessary compensatory action. But compensatory action does not mean you have to do something right now. In a democratic country, the most important thing is your voice. Because in a democratic country, the most important currency is numbers. People should speak. People have never spoken their concern for long term anything. They are asking for trinkets, government are throw, governments are throwing trinkets at them. Because after all, it's people's mandate that they have to fulfill. So people have to speak to make governments comfortable enough to invest long term. This is what the moment is about.
Yes, I mean, it's very far from being confrontational. It's a passive movement. And you're just, as I say, looking for three and a half billion people um, to sort of, I say, it's a people movement, isn't it? In the, in the way that you're trying to get them to put pressure on, on governments. Not to... even putting pressure. See, I'm saying the government doesn't even know people want this. They don't know. Just to make them aware. Yes. And, right, as you might have gathered, I don't do yoga. Just sort of looking at me, you've probably got that sort of, my, the way that I'm No, I can it. teach you <laughs> yoga where you don't have to bend and twist. Just sitting, you can do. <laughs> yoga meditation. Do you recommend I do it? And if I were, where would I start? Uh, you must do it because doesn't matter who you are, what stage of life you are, who does not need to look at how to enhance the life that we are? Everybody should. So, you can start with inner engineering. There's a simple process, I can ask them to offer it to you. You can start there with a simple online program so that you don't have to meet that highly intimidating yoga teacher. Start online in your own home and understand what it is about and then take the next step. I think that is the most frightening thing. It is there just See, I'm being... very compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> being there in a room with someone... to retired cricketers, I'm very compassionate. <laughs> no, that is, the, that is the intimidating thing. It's sort of trying to do something that you know you're useless at. No, this is not uh, physically challenging that way. It is not twisting and turning as people think it is. Yoga is not about looking like a leftover noodle, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a state of mind as well. It is... it is about enhancing life. Uh, we are calling it inner engineering. Yeah. To engineer yourself in such a way that you can function with least amount of friction within yourself. That sounds good. There's a bit of friction in my body at times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sadhguru, thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here at Lords. Thank you for sparing us some time. Um, good luck uh, with uh, your motorcycle journey <laughs> and good luck uh, with the, the Safe Soil uh, campaign. You must that you uh, could... have the cricket, cricketing fraternity around the world to speak about soil. All I'm asking is, these hundred days, you don't have to support me. Hundred days from March 21st, everybody talk about soil. We'll aggregate those numbers and put it to the governments that people want it. Well, soil is a huge thing. I mean, in cricket, all we talk about are the pitches, the quality of the pitches, and they produce uh, the best sort of cricket. So, uh, soil is, a, mm -hmm. is what cricket is played please, on. Please, in, in your community, across the world, please activate them to say something, because each one of them have millions of following. They must speak, not for me, for the soil, for the humanity, for the life on this planet. Sadhguru, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We